All right, grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we return to the Hall of Faith, and we're going to look at the end. Uh, let's pick it up that last paragraph. It rehearses, uh, kind of in summary, what those who in faith um, accomplished, or we could say it really what God accomplished through them, through their faith, and some startling and amazing things, um, and yet some also very challenging and difficult things. And we'll see that lived out as well with some of the disciples of the apostles that we're going to look at tonight. Namely, some number of them were killed, uh, martyred for their faith. So let's begin and follow along as I read. I'm going to be looking at verse 32 uh, to the end of the chapter. I'm in Hebrews chapter 11. The 11th chapter of Hebrews in the New Testament. Between James and some other book. The last of Paul's letters, Philemon it must be. All right, here we go. Hebrews eleven thirty two. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, notice all the great things they did, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And then we have this. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute and afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And all these, though commanded, commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for your word, which is true. We thank you for the gift of faith and how we can stand on your word. We thank you for how you've worked uh, in the past, and we have seen, uh, as mentioned here, particularly in Scripture, of many who counted your promises as true, knew that they were right and just, and so they followed after you. And they were rewarded for their faithfulness. Similarly, we are reminded tonight, as we look at uh, various figures from church history, that they too paid with their life, uh, in dedication of service, but then even with the very blood that was spilled uh, because of their allegiance and faith to you. Again, they testify to us of a prize that awaits all who look to you uh, past this life. May we indeed number our days, counting the prize of Christ and of heaven our greatest calling. Call us unto that. Remind us of these things, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. As you came in, I trust... If you did not have a handy-dandy, fancy workbook published by Moody, I think it is, then you grabbed one of these. But remember, if you have a workbook, you don't need this. Also, I've been sending an email kind of close to class time with this as well, in case you're very curious. Oh, what are the non-book people getting that I'm not? Well, it's in there. All right. Uh, and we're going to begin by going over some scripture memory. Oh, now, I won't call out the deacon who just destroyed it last time, destroyed it in a good way, that is, and dominated this verse so he can lead us next time, perhaps. But let us remind ourselves of this verse. And we call it to mind, especially here, as we begin Lesson 3 with the disciples of the apostles, we're seeing this very verse play out, which 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, "...you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus." And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So you have 
You then, my child, Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what Timothy has heard from me, Paul, so it's two generations, in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men, the third generation, who will be able to teach others also the fourth. And of course, if we include Jesus, we're dealing with five generations of consecutive discipleship from one to the next. Okay. So you're going to, let's read this together twice, just as I was reading it, but we're going to say it aloud together, and then we're going to work on it in small groups for a minute and come back. Okay. So here we go. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's a mouthful at the end. Let's try it again. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay, so take two, three minutes or so, I will time you, and turn to persons beside you, make groups of three, four, two, no single groups. If someone's by their self, namely Kyle, everybody will come around him, all right? You must be in a group with at least one other person. All right. So here we are, we're in lesson three. We are at the Disciples of the Apostles. And the key passage also for this chapter is this, 2 Timothy 2.2. And so we are looking at this really model for multi-generational ministry. And that's certainly a valid way to think about this verse. Again, as Paul received the gospel, he entrusted that to Timothy. Timothy was to entrust that not just to the church as a whole and disciple and evangelize, He's supposed to do that plus. He was supposed to like Jesus did, didn't he? Jesus taught the crowds, but then he had the 12, and then with even then in the 12, he had the three. That he particularly focused on to entrust into ministry because he knew and needed them to be multipliers of it. So entrust a faithful man who will be able to then teach others also. And we look back at church history, we are now starting to come where we saw a survey of Acts last time. Uh, you have Jesus and the Holy Spirit working through the apostles, those directly commissioned by Jesus. Now we have those who are the direct disciples of the apostles, which is pretty astounding. We call these guys the apostolic fathers. They are not, well, what does it mean that they're apostolic fathers? Fathers sounds like so big, like high church stuff. Kind of like, I don't know. To me, it seems scary for us as evangelicals. But we talk about like our country's founding fathers, right? Like, and so how should we, in a respectfully, respectful way, think of our founding fathers? I guess respectfully. What else? <laughs> how, how does that reference or might be a reference point for thinking about uh, a constitution or these kind of things? Okay, yeah, we can return, especially in our, in our country. What, what were those papers all written? I forget they, what they were called. But they give insight to even what they meant behind the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and things like this. Federalist, Federalist papers. papers, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So we go to them as they were kind of like the brainchild, so to speak, of the Democratic Republic, whatever we are, uh, to give us some insight into that. Well, in the same way, these guys, they are not the ultimate authority. Uh, we go back to the book. This is the authority, God's Word the apostolic word, and yet it's insightful to look at their immediate disciples. What did they understand? What did they teach? And how were they leading the church at the time? But this is why we call them the apostolic fathers. Now, as we go out from here, we'll hit other church fathers, which again, these are just the leaders of the church of the past. They didn't really birth anything in that sense, but they are the, the men that God used early on and the church was being founded. So you have the church fathers, that's the guys we'll be looking at pretty much till the one way, the Reformation, because then we have the reformers, we might call them. But you have the church fathers, and then as a part of the church fathers, you have the apostolic fathers, the direct disciples of the apostles. And we're going to look at, in a way, five of them, three of them, plus a couple other books that were written, but we're not by sure who. 
So the three men in particular we're going to look at, these three pastors, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, and Polycarp of Smyrna. And then we're going to look at two works who we don't know who wrote them, but they testify to the immediate um, teaching of the disciples or of the apostles uh, in the early church. You have the author of the Didache and then the author, whoever wrote the letter to Diognetus. Um, what's pretty cool as well is that you can find these things online for free. Isn't that sp splendid? It's stupendous. You don't need some kind of super academic money or whatever. You can get these things, even though it might be in some kind of old English, but it's still faithful translations and in very enlightening. And uh, I hope you'll see it very encouraging as well to see the trajectory the church was on. But they pose this question for discussion in your book, and it's, We've talked about this several times, looking at 1 Timothy 2.2. 2, how many generations of Christian leadership are represented there? Again, back to this verse, how many did we see? We saw five if we include Jesus. But in the very verse itself, we have at least four, right? And who are they again? Number one, who's... Paul. So we're starting with Paul, and who's he teaching? Timothy. The child, Timothy, right? And then what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, you two are entrust that to number three, faithful men. And then they are going to do what? teach that to others. So that's four generations. But then this, I love this question. What should that principle of multi-generational leadership look like in the church today? Discipling? Okay, well. Specifically people who are younger, I guess. Okay. So d what would that entail in discipling younger people? I guess teaching them the word, teaching them how to Okay, yeah, that's a big part. So taking younger Christians, whether in age or at least in maturity, or, and showing them Christ in the Scriptures, how to study the Scriptures on their own, how to teach others in the Scriptures. Good, what else? What else might entrusting to faithful men look like? Kyle? Uh, finding faithful men. To okay. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty key, isn't it? Uh, in any kind of ministry you're doing uh, in the church, let's put it the church, even at a class this size, it would be hard to get to know and disciple everyone in this room all that well. You're going to have to be strategic. Now, as we are all members of, if you are a member of Grace formally, you've committed to this body to care for one another, and we've committed to you, and so we're all in together. But you can't, again, know everybody intimately. It's just too many relationships. And in the same way in discipling, you can't disciple everybody, though you can care for everybody in one sense or another. The point is, there's going to be some you're going to have to, and you'll have the opportunity to invest in with significant uh, of your time and effort and care. And you can see even Timothy, he is to be strategic, Paul is saying, to really invest in those who will be multiplying and discipling others. Yes, James. You need to take steps to make sure that the message being proclaimed is consistent throughout the generation. Yeah, yeah. How do we do that? Holding one another accountable to the message that we've heard, um, listening to each other with uh, somewhat critical ear to ensure that the truth is being proclaimed. There's a great example of that, even in the New Testament, with the book of Galatians. What happens in that book? Do you remember how it opens? Coming back to the law. Believe how quickly they yeah, he calls them out and he's like, who's bewitched you that you've turned to another gospel that's no other gospel at all? And you see in that case, I really appreciate that example because to bring it up, James, you not only have the elders or the leaders defending the truth, but you have the whole church, those churches, Galatian churches called to defend the truth and hold the teachers to the gospel that they've heard. So we always go back to the standard. And we're going to have to do that with these church apostolic fathers too. We're always going back to the book. Do they teach what Christ has taught? Thankfully, what's super encouraging is that in many cases they do. So we'll be able to see that play out some more. But so the church as a whole, to get to the answer to that question, what does this look like? It looks like personal discipling. It looks like investing in a few perhaps, but investing deeply. And it looks like you're investing by teaching, instructing, and multiplying this gospel message. And so the church should be invested in that for generations, from little kids to pastoral training to even, you know, maybe you're a little older, but you can still multiply. The Lord's given you time. Okay, well, let's look at some of those whom were discipled directly by the apostles. 
that then have come down to us through church history. And we're going to start with a guy named Clement, Clement of Rome, who died around 100. You remember, or you might recall, what, what did we title? I don't remember. I don't recall. What did we call the last chapter? I guess from Pat, uh, Pe- Pentecost to Patmos, right? We were covering the first hundred years, and who was the last apostle to be living? John. And he died around, about around 100. And then after John dies, the apostolic era is done. There's no more apostles. So this guy, his whole pastoral ministry is within the apostolic era. He's just not an apostle himself. So it shows you how intimate this is. So Clement, getting to a blank here, he pastored the church in Rome from around 90 to 100 A.D. So again, to put it in perspective, he was pastoring the Roman congregation when the apostle John was exiled to the island of Patmos. So he was very... He would have been then very prominent, uh, if you can imagine, in the early church. Rome was a significant church from the very beginning. Now, not so prominent that there's popes in Rome. Uh, that doesn't happen for a while, and we'll get to that eventually. But the, by the Catholic recounting of things, uh, Clement is the fourth pope. The first one, of course, wrongly, but they would say is who? Peter, Peter yes. Yes. Number two, we see it would have been this guy Linus. I think it's mentioned in the New Testament. And then uh, who's the third guy? I don't have my notes handy. Yes, you're right. Good old Cletus. Now, I was reading also today, uh, and fourth would have been Clement. Now, I was doing some other, further reading today. It's quite possible that these three brothers, Linus, Cletus, and Clement, all served as fellow elders together in the Church of Rome. Uh, We're really not sure that there's any clear succession between these guys, because in some of the other uh, early church documents that we find, uh, they'll be in different orders. But these guys were all leaders of the early church, and Clement was a clear leader in Rome, especially towards the end of the first century. And as I note there, he was maybe mentioned in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, uh, if you want to look there. Philippians 4, 3. Anyone there, you can just read it, read the whole verse. So at least, if this is the same uh, individual, we're not it's precisely sure, but it is a prominent man named Clement, evidence that he could just mention him, they know who he was, and he was a fellow worker uh, with these women and with Paul for the sake of the gospel. Is Clement a common name? Um, this I can't tell you. It's not, I don't think it's incredibly rare, yes, but I can't tell you. It's a, uh, it, for example, I know like the word, uh, the name Mary is very common in the first century, but... I can't speak to Clement. Uh, It's clear that he was then also, because of his prominence in Rome, um, he was likely directly discipled in one way or another. We see it perhaps here from Philippians, but discipled by Peter and Paul uh, in some way or another. So he is a direct, really, influence and descendant, uh, spiritually speaking, from the most prominent... uh, Apostles. He has written one letter that survived. We're going to look at a quote from that. It was likely written in the mid 90s, and he wrote it to the church in Corinth uh, when he was pastoring there in Rome. Now, this is interesting. He writes to the church in Corinth, and the predominant issue he's going to deal with to the Corinthian church is unity in the midst of division. However, Has anyone read 1 Corinthians lately and might remember what Paul deals with in the first at least four chapters, if not more, of his letter of 1 Corinthians? 
Some of you say you're of Paul. Some say you're of Apollos. Is Christ divided? So the Corinthian church, <laughs> like many of us maybe, this was kind of their, uh, the sin they didn't seem to get over was the kind of divisions within in their body. And so here again, Clement is writing back. It seems as though the church at Corinth, there had been a youth movement of sorts, and they had thrown out uh, some of their older, more experienced leaders and established leaders of their own. And Clement's writing in for them to go back and bring back their old pastors <laughs> to create new unity instead of this division. And what's fun and to be noted is that Clement <laughs> teaches, as Paul did, as the New Testament does, justification by faith alone. And so we have proof of it here. Uh, in just one example, in this quote from 1 Clement uh, chapter 32. So it's a pretty long chapter, but the chapters generally aren't too long. But anyway, in the 32nd chapter of 1 Clement, uh, we have this quote. So here's Clement writing. It says, And so we, having been called through His will in Christ Jesus, are not justified through ourselves. And then he doesn't leave it there, but he goes to describe what that means. Now, backing up, the word justified, if you use two words in English to explain that, what does it mean? Declared. Declared righteous. Different than to be made righteous. Remember this. Made righteous means you actually become it. That's not the gospel. The gospel is a declaration over you. You are declared righteous by the judge. Not because you are righteous, but because Christ was on your behalf. Anyway, so you are not declared righteous, or we are not through ourselves, or through our own wisdom, because we were so smart, or our own understanding, or piety, or righteous things that we would uh, do, or the desires we have, nor was it because of works that we have done in holiness of heart. Like He's being explicit about this. But how are we justified? Through faith, by which the Almighty God has justified all who have existed from the beginning, to whom be the glory forever and ever Amen. Nate Busnitz, in his lecture, makes the great point, the supposed fourth pope sounds a lot like Martin Luther of the Reformation. The justification is by faith alone. Why would Clement teach that? Because Paul and Peter did, and it's in the Bible. Because it's the apostolic gospel. He goes on in other places to talk, too, about how our... Christian life works together. The New Testament, or excuse me, the, the Reformers make this so clear uh, when we talk about this. And, and we've dealt with this in the discussion when we were talking about declared righteous versus made righteous. But in the Christian life, you get declared righteous, and that'll be the, the root of our salvation, right? The foundation of it. We are declared righteous by God, but if we are rooted in Christ, what's then going to happen? And it rhymes with root. We're going to produce fruit. Yeah, fruit of our salvation. We're going to produce good works. But you have to have the root before you can ever get the fruit. And these are also things that Clement will affirm. Again, just like the Reformers did and the New Testament does. You can't confuse the order. So it's pretty exciting, I think, to go back and you find that the early disciples of the disciples teach what's in the Bible. Isn't that great? Especially when it's so crucial to the good news of justification by faith alone. Where others have wanted to say quite otherwise. That is, the Catholics and the um, Greek Orthodox want to claim all these church fathers for themselves, but if you claim the scripture, then you get to claim a lot of these guys too because they actually taught the scripture. If only we would look back at it. All right. Let's see. So that's a brief overview of one dude, Clement. Let's go to the next church dude, father, Ignatius of Antioch. He died in 117. He pastored in Antioch. He was later martyred in Rome. 
Antioch was a church we talked about through Acts. It was like the first other major church. Remember, this was the first Gentile church. This church is located, oh, I'm excited. I get to draw Israel. I can't wait. All right. Remember that one? We have Dead Sea, Jordan River. Oh, no, excuse me. Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Mediterranean coast. Here's the borders of Israel. But as that coast goes up, Antioch somewhere up here. And this was the first Gentile church where Barnabas and Saul that is Paul, pastor. Well, this brother Ignatius became the pastor sometime in the late first century. Uh, there's a fifth century tradition that says even Peter installed Ignatius there to be the pastor of what's called the Antiochian church. Tradition also tells us that Ignatius, along with Polycarp, was the disciple of the apostle John. So this guy, and in this ministry up here, Ignatius, He's direct, wow, that's why I use PowerPoint so you can read what I write up here. Uh, but he'd, John had fed into this guy with the gospel. And then Ignatius, of course, was teaching many others. He's written a number of letters that are survived. Uh, there's some shorter and longer ones that is, uh, it seems like either modified versions have passed on in history. But if we look at the short ones, we have some relative confidence about what he wrote. And just to give you one highlight, one theme that he brings uh, up, or we have insight into, is the early church practice regarding the Sabbath. So he notes this. This is from his letter to the Magnesians, uh, that the Christians, they worship on Sunday. It says, we no longer, we are no longer observing the Sabbath, gathering on Saturday, as we would know it anyway, but living in the observance of the Lord's Day in which also our life has sprung up again by him and his death. Of course, our life, he's speaking about Christ. Christ rose on Sunday, the first day of the week. And so this is the day that the Christians gather to worship. We see that example, too, in the New Testament already. So, for example, if you want to look at Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Paul's traveling. And as he comes to town, the church gathers, and they gather, no surprise, on the first day of the week. So Acts chapter 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together, and notice they were there to break bread. This is probably talk, speaking of communion. Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, but he prolonged his speech till midnight. I won't go that long, because I can't handle if everybody falls asleep. Nor can I raise the dead if you fell out a window. Paul could do that, so he could go all night if he wanted. <laughs> but you'll notice, uh, verse 11, they'd gone up and broken bread and eaten, and they'd been together till daybreak. But this was the practice of the early church. Or similarly, in 1 Corinthians 16, is it also verse 7? Uh, 16, 2. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. You have the church getting together, and they were going to make a collection. So he says, uh, now concerning the collection of the saints... As I directed the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. On the very first day of the week, Lord's Day, Sunday, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so there will be no collecting when I come. That is, church, when you get together, you're going to make collections. You're going to gather. And when do you gather? You gather on the first day of the week. Why? Because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. So that was the practice seemingly starting to form uh, in the New Testament time. And it's already the practice here uh, as the disciples carry on this tradition. And of course, Christians have worshipped on the first day of the week really since. Now, not everything is all great, though. We always have to hold fast to his word. And we can see even with the immediate <coughs> followers of the apostles error, and thankfully this is like little e error, but it's a concern, starts to creep in. So I have highlighted here that there's a warning. We're starting to have some doctrinal drift, and we have some of that go on with Ignatius. He advocated for what is called monoepiscopacy. That's just a fun word to say. <laughs> but you can hear mono, which is singular, 
And then episcopacy, that's related to the word for elder or overseer or bishop. And so he advocates, in some of his letters, he advocates that a single bishop would lead the church. If we could put it in our modern parlance then, you have a senior pastor who is the senior figurehead, and then all other authorities are under his. If you didn't know, Grace Bible Church don't work like that. Okay? I'm an elder, and I serve with elders. I teach on Sunday, and I have a particular role for that, true. But when it comes to what the church is doing and as we have influence and our elder board, everybody gets one vote. I get one, Bill gets one, Steve gets one, Charles gets one, everybody gets one. But he's advocating for something different. And, and this is what's so tricky, I think in this case of Ignatius and some other heresies and false practices that creep into the church over the years, I think people had good thoughts or intentions behind them. Yet, it wasn't the model we were given, and it ends up creating problems. Well, here's what he said. He said, Be zealous, therefore, to stand squarely on the decrees of the Lord and the apostles. And I'm like, Ignatius, yeah, that's a good idea, man. Why didn't you do that? But anyway, that in all things whatsoever you may prosper in body and in soul and in faith and in love, in the Son and the Father and the Spirit. Quick time. Notice, very early on, I mean, he dies in 117. He's a direct disciple of the apostles. He's using son, father, and spirit type language consistently. This is evidencing he's believing, though he doesn't have the words for it yet, but he believes in the Trinity. This was the teaching of the early church. Again, others, liberal theologians or, or other false historians are basically going to try and tell you things like, oh, the Trinity came about at the Council of Nicaea in 325. That is hogwash. There was a consistent worship of Jesus, one, but then also advocacy or mention of the Trinity or of the Father, Son, and Spirit as God uh, in the earliest of the church. And also, don't, not to mention, it's actually in the Scripture. Anyway, where was I? Faith, love, and the Son, and the Father, and the Spirit in the beginning and the end, together, and this is interesting, with your most rev reverend bishop. I was thinking of changing the name on my, outside my office. <laughs> Most Reverend Bishop. That is interesting. With your most Reverend Bishop and with your presbytery. Your presbyters are your elders, the eldership. So you have, he has a Reverend Bishop, that's a, like a key leader, and then he has the presbytery, that's a group of leaders. The fittingly woven spiritual crown. Anyway, and with your deacons, men of God. So, he has three offices here as opposed to two. We have two in the New Testament. You have pastors slash elders or bishops. That's all the same office or overseer. And then you have deacons. That's the only two offices given by Christ in the New Testament. Yet he's advocating for, in effect, that one of these presbyters is a super presbyter, the most reverend bishop. And he is the one who gets to call the shots, basically, such that Submit to the bishop, this most reverend bishop, and to each other's rights, as did Jesus Christ, and so forth. Now, where this becomes, okay, let's imagine, why, why would he advocate for this? If this wasn't the model that, say, Paul gives in his letters, why would he advocate? Because he was a bishop. Okay, boy, that's a bit self-serving, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did he see it was some way to fix a problem he saw? Yeah, yeah. He saw contention happening in these churches, and it's confusion. And if you didn't know, uh, there's some strength with having a plurality of elders. But a weakness or byproduct, I'll put it that way, is we move slowly and not quickly on making decisions. Having one executive makes things go faster, or should, than having 10 or 12. Yet, in their counsel and slowness, I think it serves us well for many of the things we must do. But anyway, beside the point, if you have one supreme leader, if I can say it that way, uh, he's going to, you have to submit to his leadership, and he's going to be able to direct with clarity. The problem is when he directs falsely, he will have less accountability to hold him fast to the word. 
So to it then, I think he was well intended in the sense of what did he see? He saw fracturing in the church. He saw they needed help. Let's position this man to have particular authority and submit to him uh, to create unity and a calmness and peace in the fellowship. But you're going to find then in these key churches, like in the Antiochian church and the Roman church and the church in Alexandria, these bishops, they're not only going to be leaders of their own church, but then the bishop is going to lead many churches. And then those key bishops over the Christian world are going to kind of lead everything. And the problem is when one of them goes squirrely, things go really bad because a lot of people go down with them. So that's a good question. How do they get to be bishops? Yeah, well, in the New Testament, so you have, for example, like in, um, let's, let's look at one just real quick, though that won't answer this question really. But look at Acts 14. So this is early on in Paul's uh, ministry, of course. And he had just gone and preached the gospel in this area. Sorry, I need to look in this Bible because I know where it is. It's on the left-hand side. Uh, Acts 14 and... He's going to go, so I'm looking in the 20s here. He goes through these towns and he's getting stoned. And then he's going to make his way back to those areas. So let's look at verse 20 of Acts 14. Uh, Oh, well, let's just back up. Read verse 19 because, again, Paul's awesome. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul. So get this. Paul was at, and this was a different Antioch, and he was at Iconium, had just preached the gospel. But the Jews are tailing him there. And so when he gets and preaches in this city, they stone him and drag him out of the city because they thought he was dead. Verse 20. But then when the disciples gathered around him, Paul rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. So... Paul gets stoned and he just gets up from the dead and goes back from the city. It's pretty awesome. Verse 21. Now, when they had preached the gospel to that city, he made many disciples. Then they returned again to these places that just persecuted him, Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. But what is his objective as he goes back there to strengthen the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So gather from this, who is the one appointing the elders? It's ultimately the congregation. They are the ones who are doing this. But granted, Paul is having a lead role in setting up congregation to do this. So congregations early on in the New Testament era, they are affirming their, their leaders and elders. Yet quickly, the... As I alluded to already, um, and it was in your notes because it was a blank, a 5th century tradition suggests that Peter gave instructions for Ignatius to be appointed the pastor. No doubt if an apostle came in, but in similar ways, you imagine um, like Paul's influence with Timothy in Ephesus. Uh, when his right-hand man goes somewhere, he's going to have a lot of authority. Yeah. But he would have been, should have been received by the congregation. Good question. What is hap- not happening yet, we trust, and we have no evidence of that, and nor was there any money to be gained. But later on, much later in the medieval church, uh, you kind of buy your way into positions. And thankfully, there's not much money to be had. All of these guys, they end up like Ignatius here. This is in your blank. Ignatius was martyred in Rome. You didn't want to be the leader <laughs> of these churches in the sense of if you're hoping for health, wealth, and prosperity. Ignatius was martyred in Rome around the year 117. According to tradition, he was fed to wild beasts, possibly in the Circus Maximus, an arena similar to the Colosseum. So, if I could meet anti Ignatius today, I'm going to quibble with him about some of his doctrine and church practice. But in the main, we affirm the same gospel, that was clear. And this brother was faithful, laying his life down. He held to these things. Yeah, Kyle. Uh, one comment on the bishops and how they got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those, those kind of key churches in Alexandria or Rome. Yeah. Got, one of the reasons why they became more powerful is because the bishops in those places could appoint the bishops in the churches in the surrounding. Oh, around, yeah. And so that's kind of how they consolidated so, some of that. Power. 
putting God, I mean, because who are you, you know, if we planted a church tomorrow, like who are we going to plant? Or who, what's the pastor we're going to set up over that place? We're going to set somebody we know and we trust. Where again, can be good, like that should be well intended. And yet you can see where that could also be nefariously used. Um, and that does happen, unfortunately, in church history. When Reggie talked about a point of the elders, I was thinking of First Timothy, where basically those are inspired. It's yeah. The person, the Holy Spirit, put in those people to raise their hand and say, and then be vetted out basically by the congregation. But it's the individual that brings it up. Yeah, he has the call of God on the man. But the call has two components. There's an internal call, the desire, the aspire, but then the church must affirm it too. You certainly don't want to just take somebody's word that they're right. called. But I'm saying how they get found. Yep. Again, with is where the, the pool come from. Yep. They have to have that desire. James, were you going to add anything? Or? I was just going to say that's from how it should happen, but I think James gives an interesting warning about when he talks about the partiality being shown mm. that a congregation would have the tendency to look at the successful or the wealthy right. and say, hey, these are, are, are important people and they get scolded for that. It's like, hey, are these the same people that oppress you? Yeah. Um, so I think practically speaking, yes, we, they should be, but I, I think that gives us insight into what was actually happening. Yep. Yeah. And I can't say Ignatius is necessarily helping with that in a different kind of way. And it is so easy. We must always be on guard, don't we? Every generation. They don't want the sign above the door like Reverend Bishop. Probably not. Yeah, no name tags, no, no even gag ones. That would be funny, though. All right, next. Let's look at Polycarp. Polycarp of Smyrna. He dies in 155, or about then. He pastors in Smyrna from 90 to 100. Again, this is still like the... He's pastoring the same time that John's still alive. He really ends up dying. He's a direct disciple of John. He ends up dying around the same time. He's a friend of Ignatius. He's a companion of Papias, another early church father, and a teacher of Irenaeus, who becomes uh, uh, one of the church fathers we'll look at, I believe, next time, if the Lord gives us time. So to look at your point then, Polycarp, was, whose name means fruitful, was a disciple of the Apostle John. He pastored in Smyrna near Ephesus for much of the first half of the second century. Uh, Smyrna is one of the seven churches listed in the book of Revelation. And his epistle to the Philippians is his only surviving letter. It was likely written right about the time that Ignatius was martyred. Again, these two pastors knew each other. They wrote letters to one another. And we have some great statements from uh, this brother, even in this one letter of some key doctrines that we know and cherish ourselves. And let's look at this first one. We see evidence of his faith and justification by faith. So he says, Polycarp of Smyrna, I also rejoice because of your firmly rooted faith, renowned from the earliest time, still preserves and bears fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ, who endured for our sins, facing even death, whom God raised up, having loosed the birth pangs of Hades. Though you have not seen him, you believe in him with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Quick time. That sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Where does he get that from? First Peter, yeah. So you can see his even reverence and estimation for the writing of the apostles that are evidently prevalent already. Uh, by which many desire to experience, knowing that by grace you have been saved. <laughs> Is he not from the Reformation here, right? This is awesome. And not because of works. And we've also heard that very same expression, though. Where else is that found? Yeah, Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Not because of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. This is in Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians. Oh, so we have copies that get passed down through history, much like we do copies of, say, the New Testament letters. Uh, many Christians, so what would happen, um, say with the New Testament, Paul writes a letter, goes to a church, the church is, they notice something different about this, namely this seems divine. They would make copies and send it off to other churches, and then those churches start making collections of these. Well, they would also do these with these letters uh, from some of the early church fathers. However, um, and we'll get more to this when we start talking about what's called the canon, the list of books. 
Um, but they didn't put necessarily, and they often did not, put these letters with those, if this makes sense. But to get to your point, these were uh, cherished by early Christians and copied, and then many copies were sent about. So that's why we have them passed down today. Yeah. But praise God for his clear testimony of faith. Um, his letters contain more than 100 citations or allusions from the New Testament. And we just saw a couple right here. Uh, he's evidently familiar with the apostolic writings, and he viewed them as authoritative. And really, Polycarp is just representative of the early church in this regard. He has a particular reverence and estimation of what the apostles said. And like we saw some other quotes uh, from a couple weeks ago, you know, they, people saw as they came afterward, they saw that their role was not equal, even though they were leaders in the church, and in many ways more significant in the sense of their uh, influence or breadth, maybe. That is, their churches, like the Roman church, might be bigger and greater in number by the time this other guy comes around, but they understand they are not the apostles. They were not writing with the same authority. Here's some other things that come up in, uh, just to give a highlight of a few. Polycarp also teaches that Jesus is both king and judge. He says, therefore, prepare for action and serve God in fear and truth, leaving behind empty and meaningless talk in the air of the crowd, believing in the one who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory and a throne at his right hand. To him, all things in heaven and on earth were subjected, whom every breathing creature serves, who is coming as judge of the living and the dead, and for whose blood God will hold responsible those who disobey. But he's both king and judge, says Polycarp in the New Testament. He also says we need to submit to God and his word. So then let us serve God with fear and all reverence, just as he himself is commanded, as did the apostles who preached the gospel to us. So again, they are, he's a recipient of that gospel and the prophets who announce and advance the coming of our Lord. Furthermore, he taught that Jesus gives us hope in death. Let us therefore hold steadfastly and unceasingly to our hope. Let's hold to the hope and the guarantee of our righteousness, who is Christ Jesus, who bore our sins in his own body upon the tree, who committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. We see that in Isaiah. We see that again in 1 Peter, the very quote. Instead, for our sakes, he endured all things in order that we might live in him. Let us therefore become imitators of his patient endurance. For if we should suffer for, his, for the sake of his name, let us glorify him. And of course, as we've already alluded to, with Polycarp, those are not empty words. He pays his life for Christ. It was this motivation, this understanding is what motivated him in faith to spill his blood for Jesus. And to that, we got to look at the death of Polycarp. So the two real testimonies we have about Polycarp are his letter, those written, but then also we, the one letter that survives. But then there was the martyrdom of Polycarp that went around the early church. This is probably the first account of a Christian martyr. That is, he wasn't the first Christian martyr, but he is the first extended account, of course, other than Stephen and James in the New Testament. But it's an awesome Rick telling. And so I just have to share it. It's so great. Okay, here we go. So here he is before the Roman governor. He's been captured. Um, a, a great story about when they go find him. Maybe some of you have seen um, in whatever account. But uh, as he's getting arrested, as they come to his house, he was the pastor in Smyrna for a long time. And as the soldiers came to arrest him, he offers them dinner. Like you imagine they're busting down your door. It's like, oh, I was about ready to eat. You guys want to eat something? So they eat, he prays while they're eating, and then they take him off to kill him. And he's brought before the Roman governor for this trial. So here, we'll pick it up here. So when then Polycarp was brought before the governor, the proconsul inquired whether he were the man. Are you really Polycarp? And I was confessing that he was. He tried to persuade him to a denial, saying, he, you know, he tries to convince him, deny Christ. Have respect for your age and other things in accordance therein, as it is their wont to say, swear by the genius of Caesar and repent and say away with the atheists. So to give you some insight here, what's happening? The, the Roman proconsul saying, you're an old man. Like, just 
Don't bother with this. Deny Christ. Or in their words, swear by the genius of Caesar, you, Polycarp, you repent and say away with the atheists. Which, of course, that seems like a strange expression. Away with the atheists. But understand, to the Romans, they saw the Christians as atheists. Why would they think that? We believed, in one God. we believed in one God. And we said all of, they had their whole uh, cornucopia of a God for everything. Remember Paul in Athens. So say away with the atheists, that is away with the Christians and the Christ. Well, what's Polycarp going to say? Oh, I skipped. There we go. I think. Is this the one, right? Then Polycarp, with solemn countenance, looked upon the whole multitude of lawless heathens, because he's in like this arena, that were in the stadium. And he waved his hand to them, and groaning and looking up to heaven, he said, away with the atheists, pointing to all of the pagans looking at him in the stadium. <laughs> but when the magistrate pressed him hard and said, swear the oath and I will release thee, revile Christ. Again, like how easy it was. Just deny Jesus and you're calm free. But Polycarp said, four score and six years I have been his servant and he hath done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Like to that we say, amen. Praise God for his boldness. But it was that assured hope of the resurrection that he'd seen passed down to him and he lived on knowing Christ personally. He then said to him again, I will cause you to be consumed by fire. And if you despise the wild beast, unless you repent, because he had said, he'd already threatened him with the wild beasts, Polycarp, and he's like, whatever. And he's like, well, we'll burn you alive if you don't repent, that is, deny Jesus. But Polycarp said, you threaten that fire which burns for a season, and after a little while it's quenched. For you are ignorant of the fire of the future judgment and eternal punishment, which is reserved for the ungodly. But why do you delay? Come do what you will. I mean, he says, bring it on. Because <laughs> he knows in the death comes resurrection because his Savior rose from the dead. I mean, these are the guys that we need to know about, right? From church history. Faithful men that walk before us. And there's more that we could say about this dear brother. And you have, uh, I think you have an extended quote, just even still, of how they saw uh, Polycarp in your booklet there. Isn't his account the first one in Fox's Book of Martyrs? I think? It probably is. If he doesn't, re I can't remember if he rehearses Stephen or James or any of the, those it's in the New Testament. The but he is the first one that was written about and circulated that wasn't part of Holy Scripture. Yeah. The earliest account that we have. Yeah, you know. He just got so mad. He stokes this thing up. Right? Man, this guy, yeah. Oh, no kidding, right? Yeah, and the story is, so this is church tradition now, which sometimes comes as seemingly like legend, but they lit him on fire and he wasn't being burned. So then they had to go, and he wasn't dying, so they had to go in with a sword and stab him through the heart as he was being burned or yeah, I think fire was all I around think in him. Fox's book, book of Mars says that the fire like went around. Him. Yes. Something like you said, probably mythical. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we will leave that in the Lord's hands. Uh, they pose this question in your notes there: What practical steps can Christians take to develop those same convictions in our hearts and lives? How do you get a? How do you get this? <laughs> like, where does this kind of? boldness come from? Of course, it comes from the Spirit, but how can we stoke that in our own heart and in one another's heart? Word and leading together. Spur one another on. Spur yeah, holding fast to that word. And we saw by some illusion, as we looked at those quotes uh, from Polycarp, he was filled with this word. He, it was just coming out in his, in his conversation and his prayers, too, we see. What else? Anything else you want to add to that? I, I would say just meeting together you're not going to get to this because you're not putting yourself in the people that are in conflict with us. So it's being in the world and allowing your message to be heard. Okay. Those who disagree. Yeah, and praying for one another to be strong in those moments, right? 
to not go solo by yourself. Evan, you were going to add? I was just thinking that living in the world that he was living in, that this probably wasn't the first time he faced persecution. Mm. And so maybe a lifetime of following Jesus and facing maybe smaller, if you could say that, persecution led him to this place. Yeah. And I think it's those small steps of faithfulness that prepare us for kind of the, the, the big moment, so to speak. Even what we see... Stepping out and challenging. challenging. Yeah. Stepping up to testing. Testifying to a hope that is within us. Um, even in the case in First Peter, which he seems to be familiar with. Again, he alludes to it in those quotes, just the couple that we looked at. But the kind of, first, uh, the kind of persecution that's going on by the time First Peter's written... It's not this. It's not yet martyrdom. Uh, it's something less than, though it's still persecution for Christ's sake. Um, but it's the same kind of truths. I mean, Jesus, he paved the way before Polycarp did, didn't he? He died for us, had the faithful testimony, and rose from the dead. And so we follow after him. But, of course, this brother has illustrated that Jesus wasn't kidding around when he said, take up your cross and follow me. We're going to look at two other writings uh, that we, these two, we don't know exactly who wrote them, but again, they are excellent windows into the very earliest part of the church after the Bible. And we have here first the Didache, it's called. That means the teaching. The full title is the teach. It almost sounds like those Puritan works, you know, the teaching of the Lord through the 12 apostles to the nations. But for short, it's just called the teaching in Greek, the Didache. It's an early manual of, this is your blank, Christian ethics. It's an early manual of Christian ethics. And its purpose really sets out the Christian life. It seems to be written for those who are preparing for baptism. Um, understand in the first century and I'll just leave it at that. But for much of church life throughout history, you're never part of the church until you're baptized, and then you're baptized into the church. That's how things work. So you then are given in this book the two ways to live. Will you walk the Christian way? And if you do, here's the expectation about how you will live. And so that, that becomes the whole thread for how the um, book is set up. Here with these two paths. This ends up sounding a lot like Psalm 1. There are two paths, it starts, one of life and one of death. And the difference is great between the two paths. Now, the path of life is this. First, you shall love the Lord, excuse me, you shall love the God who made you, your neighbors, yourself, and all things that you would not want done to you, do not do unto another. Again, we have the golden rule, the key commands that even Jesus has taught us. But it really, as like a manual or guide, covers a whole host of other matters. And I just want to highlight uh, one, of, one or two of those. One is this. Um, as it goes on in the very next chapter, we, it speaks about the ethics of the Christian life, which sound a lot like the Ten Commandments. Uh, it begins, but the second commandment of the teaching is this. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not corrupt youth. You shall not commit fornication. You shall not steal. You shall not use soothsaying or sorcery. You shall not practice sorcery as well. And then note this. You shall not kill a child by abortion. Neither shall you slay it when it's born. And you shall not cover the good, covet the goods of your neighbor. And I was curious. I was like, dude, by abortion, for real? That sounds like so evangelicalism of the 21st century. Um, and so I got like my old school Greek dictionaries. Because you can tell this is like an older translation. Um, but anyway, still English, right? But I went and looked at the Greek here. Yeah, it totally is. This is often used in abortion as se in secular Greek writers of the first century. They understood what abortion was. Is that a common practice in the first Yeah, in some way or another, yeah. And so being pro-life and being Christian, that's nothing new. The earliest church from the late 90s, so that's how old this book is as a summary of Christian teaching, either the late 90s or early 100s. Uh, my former professor, Dr. Varner, he's done a lot of study. He would contend to you that this was written before 100 AD. And already Christians are distinguishing themselves from the world by advocating for the little souls in mommy's tummies. 
Again, the, the concern to save life has always been the concern of Christians in the church. And of course, it's consistent with our, our Savior. Would, uh, would sense language be kind of like psychic reading and medium kind of stuff? Sue's saying? Yeah. Yes, I believe so. I don't remember. Yeah. One's more likely to kind of go to a psychic or a. Yeah. Yeah, that could be fair. That's good. Yes. Just a comment on the sorcery thing. Um, another commentary I was writing traces that back to more like what we would call drugs. Oh, so from the. From Machia. Stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Either way, don't do it. Stay away. That's right. Bless you. Uh, interesting, too, about some of the things we find. Like, for example, we have some teaching on what's called the mode of baptism. Mode of baptism, I know that's like theological jargon for pastor nerds, but your mode is the way you get the people wet in the water, okay? So we, and you'll see in the first century, they immersed they baptize by dunking you in the water. So some churches will sprinkle you. That will be another mode. Although pour over your head, that's another mode. But the early church, the preferable way you'll see is that they immerse. Frankly, because that's what the Greek word baptism means. It means immerse. So that's why that makes sense. But anyway, here, let's see this. But concerning baptism, so you, just to give you an idea... That kind of sounds like Corinthians, doesn't it? Paul does that. Now, concerning the things that you wrote, and then he talks about a whole topic. He does that here throughout uh, the Didache, whoever wrote this. But concerning baptism, thus you shall baptize, having first recited all these things, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That sounds a lot like Matthew's Gospel and the Great Commission. In living, that is, flowing, running water. So the preferable place to go immerse somebody was where? At the river. Yeah. Which, where did Jesus baptize? And where was he baptized? Jordan River. Jordan River. Yeah, so no, no surprise there. But this is interesting, though. And so for my hardcore Baptistness of let's immerse, okay, but what if you can't for some reason? So then he starts to qualify it all. But if you can't, if you don't have living water, running water, then baptize in other water. So, like, I got baptized in a jacuzzi. Now there were bubbles. <laughs> so I don't know. If that's living water or if that's other water. But I might be like one lower than that, right? Like a pool or something. Yeah, that's right. If you don't have a pool. And again, it, uh, sorry, there was a church historian-oriented pastor. And he, so he's a Baptist. And he was seeing these ancient churches like in, in, in the Middle East. And they have baptismals there. And the baptismals, they're not little fonts for babies. They're like pools so you can get inside. So he was texting all of his Presbyterian friends like, ha, 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 can't you see? The early church immersed the whole time. Anyway, that's what we had done. But if uh, then baptize in other water, a pool or something, and if you're not able to do it in cold water, then warm's okay. <laughs> I, but it's still, it's like a couple of tears down, tears down, you know. So why do we heat our <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you. I was baptized in cold water, so I guess. You're good. You're good. Well, you're better. Really cold water river. Yeah. The, we've baptized some people in the river, though. Last time I did it, I thought I almost lost somebody, but that's another story. Verse 3 then. And if you have neither of those, then pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it's interesting. They were willing to accommodate the mode, but they had a clear preference for what they thought was most faithful, right? But nevertheless, the implication would be this is entirely acceptable. So this also is how we function at grace, to give you an idea. So we immerse, and we only immerse, because it's the best picture, and what the early church did, but it's the best picture of dying with Christ and rising from the dead, okay, of your new life. So that's the way you should be baptized. And you must be baptized as a believer. There's no baptism without belief. And that'll be a fun story in a little while. But anyway, I must hold my tongue there. So you have to first be a believer. Then you go through a water ritual of baptism. And we immerse because that's the faithful way to do it. But what if, and this has happened with one member. I won't say who they are. <laughs> they were baptized as a believer in a church, but not by the mode 
of immersion. So what do you do? Did their baptism count or not? We can debate that in a little while. As the eldership, we said, it is an irregular baptism, but it's still a baptism. And honestly, this passage from the Didache was on my mind, where the early church, they, they saw the ritual, even the form of it, as important, but is that the essential piece? Well, they're willing to accommodate it, aren't they? Because the point isn't the, the physical thing. Even Peter talks about that. It's not the washing of dirt off the body. It's what it points to. Anyway, I'm going to look down at my notes and not raise my head, but you can ask me after class any further questions about that. Uh, also, I don't recall if I have more on the Didache, but that's so much fun. Oh, just some other things that you can go read about in the Didache. You can t- it talks about how they worship on the Lord's Day, how they fasted, how they prayed the Lord's Prayer. The whole uh, script of the Lord's Prayer is in the Didache. Uh, how they conducted communion. They had particular prayers, they said, when they served the, the wine and then when they served the bread. Uh, they also had a section on how to handle traveling prophets. This also clues us in we are very early in church life. Because as we noted, revelation, new information with the apostles, ended with the apostles. Well, who also is giving new information with the apostles? The prophets. Okay, we see that in first, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. But when the apostles drop off, so do these prophets. But there's still some prophets around as the Didache is being read. And finally, he gives them instruction on how to appoint leaders in the church. And there's only two offices. So in your eye, who was it, Ignatius? There's only two of them. Bishops or elders, it's the same office, and then deacons. Now, is that communion like what we have now, or is it the body and blood of Christ? No, it's like what we have now. Yeah, yeah. That develops later. Yep. Yeah. But were they eating a, a big meal, or was it literally just like... Um, well, no, they, yeah. I mean, they probably didn't have the delicious little crackers that we give out. <laughs> and nor was it juice. I can probably assure you of that, too. But it might have been watered down to save some. Uh, they would have often, depending on the church, but they would have had meals afterward. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But they would have had a component of the service that was just this. Yep. All right, one more. Uh, the epistle, epistle to Diognetus. This is the, now the middle of the second century, so about 150. This is cool. It's written by an anonymous author. He just calls himself the Mathetes. That's the Greek word for, for disciple. And he's sharing the gospel with this guy, Diognetus. And so this letter serves as kind of like a gospel track from the second century, from the 100s. So if you imagine writing a letter to an unbeliever, what would you say and how would you describe the gospel? That's kind of what Diognetus does here. And this uh, fills in a couple blanks from your text. It contains a beautiful description of our salvation in Christ, how sinners can receive both, your blanks there, forgiveness and justification through Him. Wow, you know what though? I mean, that works. That's perfect. But I have different blanks in mine, different answers. And I stole that information from Dr. Boosnett's website. Okay. Does it fit with your blanks that you have? Yeah? The alternates are forgiveness for sin. I guess that works. And eternal life. Hmm. No, they're both true because you have eternal life through justification. So either way, we're good. But I love this quote. I, too, have come across this quote when I was doing a lot of study in, uh, on the nature of justification. So quick backstory on my own church history journey. Uh, I, a really good friend of mine, the guy who led me to Christ, actually, he went to an evangelical school in Chicago. I say evangelical now, almost in quotes. And he had been caught up in some teaching that was, came to be known as the New Perspective on Paul, which in short said... Paul, the way we've been reading Paul, like especially since the Reformation, we've been reading him wrong. He isn't about justification by faith alone. He's about some other stuff. And my friend was all up into it. And so then I just dove deep in my academic studies. I kind of threw off all my other classes to really study justification. And I was doing search even on church history, trying to find some quotes. And uh, you come to this one, 
which is so good. Again, these, all these people are saying, no, the reformers just made up justification by faith alone. And more than that, they made up the whole idea of substitutionary righteousness. Okay, because here's the thing of the gospel. The Catholics will say that, and we agree with them, that your sins get put on Christ. And that's the gospel. He bears our sins. But we say something more than that, because the New Testament does. Not only does he get our sins, but what do we get in return? We get his righteousness, such that Christ looks at us, or the Father looks at us, and looks and sees Christ and his perfect life on our behalf. And so, anyway, many scholars have said, oh, that was all made up by the Reformers, Martin Luther in particular. Well, talk to Mathetes, who wrote this epistle, because he says the very same thing. It's glorious. Okay. And it's worth seeing in full. So he says, And when our iniquity had been fully accomplished, and it had been made perfectly manifest, that punishment and death were expected as its recompense. So we're utterly sinful, and we need to be punished for it. And the season came which God had ordained, when henceforth he should manifest his goodness and power. Oh, the exceeding great kindness and love of God. You just got to love this guy. I mean, he's already just praising God for this. God hated us not, neither rejected us, nor bore us malice, but was long-suffering and patient. And in pity for us, took upon himself our sins. And like I said, the, the Catholics agree with us here. And with Mathetes, who wrote this. And himself parted with his own son as a ransom for us. Again, they still agree. The holy for the lawless, the guileless for the evil, the just for the unjust, the incorruptible for the corruptible, the immortal for the mortal. For what else but his righteousness would have covered our sins? Well, now the, the Catholics are becoming uncomfortable because you're seeing that all of this language, the holy for the lawless, the guileless for the evil and so forth, the just for the unjust, Peter even uses that phrase. It's not just a one-way street. It's not a mere giving, but there's an exchange that happens. Hence, as he explains... By what other one was it possible that we, the wicked and ungodly, so how could it be? Could we be justified, declared righteous, then by the only Son of God? Oh, sweet exchange. Oh, unsearchable operation. Oh, benefits surpassing all expectation that the wickedness of many should be hid in one righteous one and, so this is just like Paul though, but and the righteousness of one should justify the many transgressors. But it's a sweet exchange. He gets our sin, we get his righteousness. We don't merely become innocent before God because all our sins are taken away. We are seen as having fulfilled the law and righteous because we stand on Christ's righteousness. But these are the very things Paul talks about. Again, he talks about the righteousness we receive from God on the basis of faith. Such a glorious picture of the gospel, and it's nothing new, but it's the same, same old story that, yes, Calvin had taught us, and Luther, but also Mathetes, and Paul, and John, and Peter, and Jesus. So, to kind of bring it together then, what do we see as we look at this period? We see God provided faithful men to pass on and protect the gospel. Uh, we see that though they're not authoritative, these men help preserve the very writings and teachings and practice of the apostles. We saw that they were faithful. They, they sought to live out God's word, and they did with their very life. Uh, we discover in them clear defenses of the true gospel, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, not on the basis of works, the very language we use. And finally, they demonstrated their faithfulness with the price of their very lives. As we saw Clement and Ignatius and Polycarp, they all died as martyrs. Yeah, this was, if we could get to it, as we said, you, if you were appointing your friends to such positions, you were probably appointing them to their death. But these were the faithful that came before us. So to that, we have a minute. Any last comment or question? Yeah, John. Outside of Peter, were they the rest of Gentiles? Oh, that's a good question that I don't know, Ralph. No, I do. Yep. Do you know how these guys were on the Polycarp? Polycarp is pretty old. Yeah, Polycarp is 86. Um, 
No, not right off. Man, never mind. Forget the questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have we have some clues. The gospel was going out. Uh, I can't speak to it like where it was by 100 so well. Uh, but in the next, like by 300, we have, it's really spreading all over the world, even off into Asia, like far off into Asia. Uh, of course, we from what we understand from history, Thomas went to India, but then the gospel keeps on going farther from there. We find some really cool um, historical evidences of a Christian presence uh, in these Asian countries, which is particularly astounding because like the new missions movement of the, what, the I mean, 17, 1800s to the 1900s was all about evangelizing that part of the world. Well, the gospel had been there once before. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's not as prominent. Yeah. And they won't be the if you think of the Mediterranean world, sorry to reference my beautiful map, uh, the lead churches uh, will be pretty much around, around that Mediterranean Sea, between Rome, uh, the Antiochian Church, the Alexandrian Church, but then finally um, you're going to have the, the Byzantine Church, like in Istanbul, and some, I can't remember where it moves from there. But those would be the prominent kind of hubs of Christianity. But again, even at this time, as evidenced by these men dying, as the leaders, you know, Christianity is kind of like an underground movement, more and more so. There's not constant persecution, but there's waves of it. And so they have to keep it on the DL. Uh, one of the unique ways that those main areas around the Mediterranean um, were able to be passed down through history is that the, even just the geography and the climate that they had, that they could put these letters and they could be lost in a room for or 500 years, and then some guy at 600 can make a copy of it, and we can know what Polycarp was or something like that. Whereas there's other climates, like in Asia or other parts of Europe, where it just doesn't, things don't last the same way. Yeah, that's a great point. Like the, the things that we have in China, like they're literally etched in stone. Like yeah. Who know the gospel was there. That's right. Yeah, that's a great point. Much of like the many copies of the New Testament we have are discovered out of Egypt, which is a very dry climate. So paper preserves there, or the papyrus, but um, yeah. Oh, the, the stories that we will hear, Lord willing, in heaven that day. These churches that these men were leading, were they house churches or big churches? Do we know the size? Um, oh, I don't know the numbers. I mean, they, these are significant churches, though, so we're, we're talking. They, they couldn't meet just in a home. This is, uh, so this is true. Um, that's a great question. Sometimes very large homes, although like we saw with Paul, they rented schools. Or this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, great questions. Yeah, let's close the questions quick before I get more <laughs> questions. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your abundant mercy. We thank you for your faithfulness, how you preserve the, your church. And we thank you for the men that have gone before us that paid with their lives, but it was that testimony and their faithfulness that you use to bring to us the gospel. And for that, we praise you. May we be like them in following you, uh, but may we be fully devoted to your word in every way uh, as we pass on the gospel to the next generation until you return. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.